Hey guys, and welcome to episode 123 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now this episode is going to be about medication. So I asked you guys uh, through Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, I believe, um, a little while ago now, your questions, if I were to get a psychiatrist on to talk about medication, what would they be? And I got, I think, something like 50 questions um some of them duplicated one another some i obviously couldn't ask because they're about dosages and that's a very personal thing and sh- a conversation that should be had with a psych your own psychiatrist or medical doctor um but dr david sherman uh kindly agreed to come on to answer your questions now before we get into it i do want to do a disclaimer this podcast is not medical advice and although Dr. David Sherman is a psychiatrist and trained medical doctor, advice around medication should come from your own psychiatrist and own medical doctor. So this podcast was merely just to educate slightly, give you some information that so when you're in that doctor's room, the psychiatrist's room, you can have a more informed discussion and uh, and a lot of the stuff that David shares is from research. So please just see this episode as information and entertainment, and uh, please speak to a trained medical professional uh, about medication, if it's right for you, if you're on it, um, if you want to come off it, or if you're having side effects, That those types of conversations should be have with your own medical professional. So disclaimer aside, it was very great to get Dr. David Sherman on. I think he had a very unbiased approach to medication, a very scientific one. He talks off research uh, and it was interesting to hear him ask your questions. Our conversation wasn't as conversational as it usually is on the podcast because uh, this topic is about medication and I'm not a trained medical professional. I wanted to ask the questions you'd ask without putting my own opinion in too much. So I sit back quite a lot on this. I let David do a lot of the talking um, and I was really fascinated by his answers. So without further ado, here is David. On the podcast today, I have Dr. David Sherman, who has kindly agreed to come on the show to answer your questions around medication. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. It's good I'm to, glad to be here. Thank you. It's uh, it's good to have you on, and it's been a been a challenge getting someone on to talk about medication. Um, so I appreciate you coming on to answer because I've I've was when I put out to the the listeners to get their questions there were so many questions that came back um, and we're going to try and do most of them here we've had to remove some because they were too specific um, so I appreciate your time but it would be good to find out a bit about a bit more about yourself uh, your profession and what you do sure so again my name is Dr. David Sherman and I'm a psychiatrist practicing in New York City for about 15 years now. And for much of that time, I've also been an assistant professor of psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center. And I would call myself um, a psychiatry generalist. But over the years, I've developed a particular expertise in treating people with OCD. It was part of my training at Columbia. I trained at Columbia as well as Mm. teaching there afterwards. And and now it's become a big part of my practice. So I took it. And um, I know I know that today we're going to talk mostly about medication. But yeah. I want to say at the outset that um, while medication can play an important role in OCD and sometimes even a life saving role, it's really psychotherapy, specifically CBT, that really should be considered the heart of treatment. And so while we're talking about medication, I always want to not forget that important point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that point. I think it's an important one. Um, okay. And thank you for introducing yourself. So every it's worth me saying every question I'm going to ask you today is from the listeners. Um, so the first one is, what are the most common medications prescribed and some of the side effects? Yeah. So... By far, uh, the answer is a family of medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, which is a mouthful. So for short, those are called SSRIs. 
And they've really become the most commonly prescribed medication for OCD for two reasons. The first is because they are at least as effective as any other medication that we have today. And the second is that they have a relatively benign uh, set of side effects. And I know that we're going to talk about side effects later. Yes. Um, and they definitely, they certainly do have side effects, but they're relatively benign compared to some of the other options that we have. Um, and so this family of medications, I'll just list what they are. Um, there are ones probably that most, many people have heard of. Uh, there's fluoxetine, which was the very first SSRI, at least in the States, it was the first. Uh, there's fluvoxamine, which is also called Luvox. There's sertraline, which is in this country, in the States, called Zoloft. Uh, there's paroxetine, which seems to be common in the UK for some reason, and maybe a little bit less common here. There's citalopram. And there's e-citalopram, and there's maybe two or three newer ones as well. And interestingly, within this family of several medications, none is felt to be better than another. There have been some, some studies comparing some of these medications head to head, and at least as far as the, the studies could resolve, there wasn't one that seem to be any more uh, effective than another, at least across a population, which you know studies yeah. include usually hun hundreds of people, and at least across large groups of people, one wasn't any better than the next one. And about probably about 50% of people um, who are treated with one of these medications have have some response, some benefit. Uh, to the medication. And um, when there is a response, it's definitely not a cure. It's what we would call an amelioration or an imp improvement. So not a resolution of symptoms. And really the improvement, um, I think by the sound of it, is, is modest. It's usually 20 to 40 percent sy symptom reduction. Which, um, which is modest, but uh, for an individual, it can, it can maybe make a difference between being able to um, do certain things in life mm. um, and possibly also engage in psychotherapy in a more effective, uh, in a more effective way. Yeah. No, thank you. That's a really good breakdown. Um, okay, so... That leads on to the next question, which is, how do SSRIs work for OCD? Okay, so um, I dread this question when a patient asks, <laughs> and that's because we really don't know for sure. Yeah. And I think I, I find that a little disconcerting, and I think patients find it very disconcerting, but it's mostly true. Um, that said... Uh, we do know that SSRIs boost a certain brain chemical called serotonin. And um, there is evidence that in OCD, there are certain parts of the brain where serotonin seems to be underactive or um, where there isn't enough serotonin. And when people are effectively treated for OCD, we see that these areas of the brain actually, um, the activity, the serotonin activity in these areas normalizes um, to a large extent. Mm. Uh, but I don't think we can say that we fully understand how these medications work. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Um, and the next question is around depression. So the, the listeners asked, um, I've heard depression is a deciding factor on whether or not to start medication. Uh, what other reasons are there to start medication? Yeah, so that that's a really important question. It's a, I think it's a question that 
um, there, people approach differently. Psychiatrists approach it differently depending on their eagerness to prescribe. And I think patients might approach it differently depending on their comfort in taking medication. Um, and I think there are a few, a few things that I think about. Um, and I would say they're kind of on the face, obvious, I think, but um, worth, worth listing. Mm. The first one, sorry, my phone is That's ringing. Okay. Uh, the first one is simply symptom severity. Yeah. Um, how much are, is an individual's symptoms really affecting their quality of life, um, their kind of day-to-day experience of life, uh, as well as how much are the symptoms interfering with their functioning? Are they able to work effectively? Are they able to um, sustain, to have relationships, uh, to have you know, a family life that's not overly encumbered by symptoms. Uh, and when, when OCD is severe, it can obviously affect all of these areas of life in a very dramatic way. Yeah. Uh, so those are the things that I look for. And another thing is that um, I think, as I said earlier, it's almost always helpful and important for someone to be in behavioral therapy for OCD, and um, but sometimes symptoms are so severe that they can't fully, they can't really engage in behavioral therapy. Mm. So if if medication makes the difference uh, and allows someone to to be able to do um, the the therapy, which is often really difficult work, um, exposure therapy and response prevention then, you know, that, that would be a really useful and important um, aspect of, um, of the treatment. And then the question asked about depression, I think that's also a reason to consider medication. If, if someone not only is struggling with OCD, but has pretty significant depression, uh, that would be a good reason to consider medication. Fortunately, the same medications that we use to treat OCD are often um, treatments for depression. So in a way you can kill two birds with one stone mm. um, in those cases. Okay, excellent. No, thank you. That's a really good breakdown. So the next question, I think this is a common one for a lot of people is around tackling fears around medicine. And I think, what goes along with fears is the stigma that can be attached to it. So a few of the fears li listed here are uh, the fear of side effects, the fear of dependence, uh, and f uh, fears that the medication will lose effectiveness and they have to switch to a different one. Yeah, I, you know, I think that that's where a lot of a lot of us psychiatrists kind of fall down on the job is really taking the time to address all of these fears um, in a very open, uninvested, non-judgmental way. Um, because I, I think that that's probably the biggest barrier to medic to have it, to allowing medications to actually be helpful in, in someone's life. Um, and so I think as important as what gets prescribed, it's how it gets prescribed. And I think we always need to make sure to leave plenty of time um, in our consultations to discuss medication, what to expect and when, and to discuss um, the, the potential side effects, uh, to discuss what to expect when someone wants to come off these medications, which we'll talk about further uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, often patients take a few visits before they feel comfortable filling a prescription. And I think we should really respect that. Um, and I think it, it makes sense that, you know, it's a medic taking medication is, is a big decision. Um, so, so I think, I think there's value in simply having a consult, you know, about medication, feeling like you're being listened to getting your questions answered. Um, and, really feeling like you've made your own decision around whether or not to take medication. 
Um, and then addressing specific concerns that are so common for people. Um, so I think there's the fear of side effects, which mm. we'll talk about the different potential side effects. Um, I think that's, you know, a big thing to address. And, and fortunately, um, the side effects are reversible. So, you know, I, I always make sure to tell a patient if, if they do end up trying a medication and they find that the side effects are not worth the benefit that, that they can always stop, that they, you know, always yeah. have the power to make that decision. Um, Another issue is that, that I find very common is people fear the loss of control, that you know, they're taking a medication that affects their brain, and there's a fear that, you know, that they'll lose some part of themselves and that they might not really, they might not know who they are or really recognize themselves. Yeah. And I think these medications, while they, you know, they can, while they are, powerful and significant, they generally don't um, change personality, which, you know, some people fear that their personality would be changed. Um, so I try to assure, reassure them about that. Um, and I think it, in some cases, it's helpful to point out how, how their OCD really kind of results in some loss of control, loss of freedom, and that while medication might feel like a different type of loss that it's it's really weighing weighing the pros and cons um, in that sense uh, and then as far as addiction I think maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about stop stopping medication yeah but um, uh, uh, met, these medications SSRIs and some of the other medications that we'll we'll come to later are not addictive in the sense that people don't develop um, a physiological need for them. They don't develop a dependence on them. And yet sometimes they can be hard to stop. Um, and I think it's important to, to talk about that. Um, but it, it would be different than being addicted to um, certain other recreational drugs that that where there's a true physiological de dependence that develops. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's really good. Um, I know it's, it's what I've heard a lot in the community is it's kind of the worry around taking them. So I think that was a good breakdown. Okay. So next listener question is, uh, have you ever had someone where the SSRI does not build up in their system like it should? Um, what would you do about it? And then they put kind of raise the dose, switch meds, add meds, et cetera. Yeah. So, so um, these medications, um, pretty much all of them are metabolized by the liver. And the liver is more than, um, more than, more than strong enough to met metabolize all these medications. It doesn't pose any danger to the liver, but everybody's liver is different. And, um, each one of these medications is met, met, metabolized in a slightly different way by different sets of enzymes. Mm. And because our genetics, because we are all different in our genetics, some people metabolize medication, a certain medication more slowly. And sometimes um, there are people who metabolize medications very quickly. And so Dosing can be tw tricky, and there's a wide range of dosing that might be appropriate for any individual for a given medication. So if someone doesn't seem to be responding at all to a medication, it is possible that they're just very quickly metabolizing the medicine. So sometimes it's worth increasing the dose um, to see if, um, if they start to get benefit at higher doses. And vice versa, some people metabolize medications or a specific medication very slowly, and so they might be sensitive to a very low dose. Um, so it's definitely not one size fits all. Um, and so we can kind of, we can determine that clinically by trying different doses, but when it seems like we're not able to figure out what truly is going on, 
it's also possible to measure blood levels of a certain medication. For instance, yeah. you can order a blood level of, of sertraline or of fluoxetine. Uh, it's not routinely done because it's expensive and a little bit esoteric, but, but it is possible to do that as well. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, I suppose you don't need to routinely take blood because there's no direct uh, potential damage being done to the body, like, for example, something like lithium. That's right. Yeah. With SSRIs, usually there is no blood work required. I would say a minority of psychiatrists do maybe check um, blood work uh, once a year. Hmm. Um, but I would say that's, yeah, not, not everybody feels that that's necessary. Um, that said, if, if there's a question of something medical going on that might be contributing, you know, to the seemingly psychiatric symptoms, then it would obviously be important to get blood work or possibly get a consultation, uh, with, a an internist or a primary yeah. care doctor. Okay, cool. Um, so <clears throat> You mentioned it a few times already, but uh, the next question was around side effects. So just kind of what are some of the common ones that you see with your clients? Yeah, so um, the first point I'd like to make um, is that in the first days of taking a medication, I would say even up to maybe four weeks, um, it's really critical to to really um, stay in touch with um with a patient to make sure that they're tolerating it. Okay. Because a lot of, um, there are a lot of potential side effects when the body is first getting used to the medications. Um, and these often, um, these often go away, but it's, it's important for a patient to know what to expect because I've, I've actually had, um, meetings with countless patients who have tried medications in the past. Um, but they really weren't educated as to what to expect when they're first starting. Um, you know, I usually tell patients that when they're first starting, they could actually feel more anxious mm. in the first few days, or they can, it's not uncommon to feel tired or, or con conversely to feel, to have trouble sleeping. And if you aren't prepared for that, you might feel like, like the medication is, is, is bad uh, that you're on the wrong track. <laughs> and so it's really, I find that probably one of the most important parts of successful treatment is just preparing a patient for what to expect. And then if they do have some of these initial side effects to just really, if they're mild to support them and normalize that experience um, so that they can get through the first few weeks um, and as I said, these usually resolve in those first few weeks and then uh, to get to the point where they can start to hopefully experience, experience some benefit from the medication. So, so those are short-term side effects, like more anxiety, yeah. tiredness, trouble sleeping. But there are also, um, also long-term side effects, which, uh, which are definitely, um, definitely real. Um, and I would say I, I usually make sure to talk about four different um, areas uh, of side effects. The first one would be um, some, some form of sleep disturbance. And that could be feeling like you're sleeping just not as deeply. That maybe you require an hour or more of sleep to feel rested and that's, that's a real thing because sometimes these medications do decrease the amount of deep sleep that, that people are getting. Um, so they might need a little bit more sleep. Um, and then there's also a possibility of having vivid dreams, which uh, for, I would say, a minority of people, they can be kind of disturbing because they can feel very lifelike sometimes. Nice. So that's, that's the area of sleep. And then... Um, there's uh, the area of weight gain, which um, people are often very concerned about. And I would say that um, 
maybe one in three people who take SSRIs will have some weight gain. Um, and it's usually quoted as maybe two to 5% of, of body weight, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, most people, <laughs> that's a big deal for most people. And I, yeah. I also take it seriously um, because yeah, being, you know, gaining weight is, is not good for your health and it doesn't make you feel good for most people. Yeah. So, um, and there are certain ways of, of working with that, uh, which maybe we can, I think we can talk about later. Um, but, but that's not uncommon. And then once in a while I see people gain more significant amounts of weight, but that I would say that that's quite rare. Um, and then the third area of side effects, um, are sexual side effects, Hmm. which, um, which are also can also be troublesome for some people. And again, I would say maybe one in three women um, really kind of struggle with certain sexual side effects and maybe less men, uh, maybe, you know, one in five men might also struggle with some of the sexual side effects. And those can be a loss of libido. Uh, in other words, just a somewhat decreased interest in, in sex. Um, and then also... Uh, the possibility of delayed orgasm. Hmm. And then once in a while, just um, for, more so for women, just a, a difficulty or an inability to have an orgasm, which, which is, that's a serious side effect because it can really affect quality of life and relationships, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then the fourth common side effect, I would say, would be some level of feeling um, an em- emotional numbing. Um, and again, it's, rem- it's important to remember with all of these that a lot of people have none of these side effects. So I don't want to, you know, scare people too much, but I would say it's not uncommon. Maybe, maybe, you know, 25% of people have some feeling like they don't experience, um, emotion quite as strongly. Yeah. And, it can sometimes be uncomfortable that they feel like they're not fully, not as fully kind of um, experiencing, experiencing emotion um, in their lives. So, yeah, so those are the common ones and there are others that are possible, but I think those are, are the ones that usually come up, you know, if, if side effects are an issue for, for an individual. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, thank you for breaking it down to categories as well. So the next question ties perfectly into this, which is, um, is there a way of mitigating the side effects? Yeah. So, um, for those early side effects that uh, come up when you're first starting medication, the best thing is often to just wait it out. If they're not too uncomfortable, um, that, often those do get better or resolve completely. Um, if, if they're more severe, obviously, and this has happened sometimes, you know, I decide it's just worth stopping and maybe trying something else. Um, for longer term side effects, um, I would say um, if they are nuisances but are tolerable, um, probably the, the first strategy would be to just try and lower the dose a little bit. And hopefully there's a sweet spot where there's, you know, still a benefit, the, still a good benefit from the medication, but the side effects, you know, become less of an issue. Yeah. Um, and then a third possibility uh, would be uh, to, for specific types of side effects, sometimes to introduce another medication. Um, and I would say most patients are loath to do this. It's hard to get onto, it's hard to sometimes, you know, feel like you have to take one medication, but to take a second one to deal with side effects is sometimes um, not, you know, that, not a patient's favorite thing to do, but, yeah. you know, sometimes that strategy can really help. Um, and if someone is really benefiting from a medication, it, it can it can, you know, help help them stay on a medication. Okay. And then I guess if, if if all else fails, there's always yeah, there's always 
uh, switching a medication. Like, but um, you know, if a medication is really helping, then switching is kind of a, I would say, a last resort, okay. um, unless it's really necessary. Yeah. So almost try and manage the side effects first, and then yeah, switch switch as a last resort. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, so, I, I guess you lo- you loosely uh, answered this at the start. But the next question is, why does medication not work for everyone? Yeah. So, um, I would say that medication. Um, some, you know, there is a medication out there that would work for probably the majority, maybe even the vast majority of people work to some extent. Um, but um, I think, you know, for some people, it's a long process. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, if someone is trying medication, they'll be lucky and the first medication will be, you know, will be helpful to them um, and, you know, provide significant benefit. But um, sometimes it's the second or the third medication, or, and sometimes it's a combination of medications that, um, that, you know, that do the trick. So um, I, I would say, you know, for people who've been on medication and it hasn't helped for them and they're really suffering, I would really encourage them not to give up, um, to really, um, you know, in addition, obviously, to psychotherapy, to, um, to finding someone that they feel they can work with to maybe try something different or try, you know, try something novel. Um, uh, it's not uncommon for the third or fourth medication to be the one that really works. Mm. Um, and so just, it's important not to give up. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Good words of hope. Um, okay. So next question is, uh, do you build up resistance to certain SSRIs over time? Uh, and therefore, is it a good idea to try a new, a new medication from time to time? Yeah, so this is um, an area of a lot of controversy, I would say, in psychiatry. Mm-hmm. With the the, va- the majority of my colleagues seem to not, yeah, to not kind of believe that there's such a thing as building a resistance to SSRI specifically. Um, I would say I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I think that medications, yeah, do sometimes stop working. Um, whether we call that building, you know, that uh, that someone built a resistance or whether there is a new stressor, uh, a, you know, a new stressor in someone's life yeah. or something else going on. Maybe, you know, maybe it's that someone is also it has become depressed um, that uh, it, it's not clear, but but sometimes uh, it is important to switch. You know, if a medication doesn't seem to be helping, it's um, it's important to switch. Or if a medication is helping but maybe isn't helping as much, then sometimes it can be helpful to consider an augmentation, uh, taking a second medication uh, in addition to uh, the one that they're taking. Um, I would say it's, it's never a good idea to switch if a medication is continuing to be helpful. Uh, in other words, it's really not necessary or recommended to switch um, a medication preemptively just um, to, because you're anticipating that it'll stop working. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, good, good answer. So the next one is... Um, uh, why did I put on so much weight uh, when on medication? Yeah, so um, I quoted the number um, that maybe one in three people gain two to five percent of body weight. Yeah, um, and that can feel like a lot of weight. Um, and then I've had maybe two or three patients who've gained considerably more than that um, for whatever reason. And I don't think I don't think we truly understand why for instance, why SSRIs cause weight gain, whether it's a change in metabolism or an increase in appetite, or maybe it's different for different people. Um, But um, I think it's important to to put it out there as a possibility when someone is first starting medication that they might have some weight gain. 
Uh, so at least they have the opportunity to maybe make some some behavioral changes in their life, um, you know, to hope, hopefully counterbalance that. Yeah. Um, but if, you know, if, if an individual does gain weight and, you know, it's important for them to, that, to try and work on reversing that, then I sometimes recommend working with a nutritionist or even with um, like a, a clinic-based weight management program uh, to help address that. Um, and obviously this is, these are for people who, who are getting a lot of benefit, benefit from the medication and want to stay on the medication yet, you know, are, are unhappy because of the weight gain. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, good, good answer. Um, the next one is around pregnancy. So they want to know if there's any medications they should avoid if wanting to get pregnant. Yeah, so this this is um, a big question in, um, I would say, in medicine in general, uh, including in psychiatry and including in, um, you know, in OCD treatment. Um, and it's also, it's very, in, in psychiatry, it's very individual. Um, like, for instance, I would say uh, if someone is thinking about getting pregnant and it's, it's always a good idea to, to think, you know, think this through before you get pregnant. It's important to really have a discussion with your psychiatrist about the pros and cons of staying on a medication uh, versus stopping. And I think, you know, usually there are pros and cons on both sides of that question, but it's different for different people. Um, that said, yeah, and it, 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 I, I want to also say that it's a, a question that um, that women often really struggle with, um, feeling guilty uh, if if they do, you know, if they are thinking about staying on a medication during pregnancy, um, and so it's it's a it's an area where patients generally need a lot of a lot of reassurance and support um, around whatever decision they make. And so on one end of the spectrum, I, I would say there are definitely people who clearly um, it's worth trying to come off the medication before they get pregnant, um, that um, their symptoms are mild, that they are doing well in behavioral therapy, and that, you know, it's a good time to try and stop the medication. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who have symptoms that are so severe that that do come back when they're not taking medication or that have other uh, mental illness such as severe depression that has been recurrent um, throughout their life where it often does make sense for them but also for for their uh, their fetus and the baby um, that um, that is that is coming uh, to stay on the medication. Um, fortunately, the the SSRIs have a reasonable um, safety record around pregnancy, and it's not to say that there are no risks. There there are, uh, which you know we could get into, um, but there the the risks are you know reasonably. Um, sometimes, you know, reason worth worth the uh, the alternative, which um, where there is risks as well. There's, you know, there's a lot of risk um, in having severe anxiety or severe depression during pregnancy, uh, and and also postpartum. Um, among the SSRIs, um, if someone does choose to to stay on medication, we have the best data on. Uh, fluoxetine and sertraline, and also possibly citalopram. Um, and so those, yeah, those are those we feel most comfortable if someone is to stay on medication, uh, that they be one of those medications. Um, the only SSRI that, that, um, that should be flat out avoided is paroxetine. Uh, and that's because um, it's really the only 
um, the only SRI that has been demonstrated to have uh, uh, birth defects as a risk. I mean, it's a small risk, but it's a risk. Whereas with the other SSRIs, the other older ones, I'm not talking about the the ones that have been introduced in the last few years, which we have very little data on, but the older ones don't appear to have any um, risk for birth defects. Um, so, um, so sometimes it, it does make sense for a woman to stay on a medication during pregnancy. Um, and also, um, also postpartum, um, including during breastfeeding. Okay. No, thank you. That was, so that's, but it's, yeah. that's a, it's actually a very complicated area. Yeah. And as I said, that's, that's an area that's really important to, um, to speak to a, a psychiatrist and sometimes even a psychiatrist who specializes in, um, in pregnancy. Um, they're in this country, they're called reproductive psychiatrists. It's, it's kind of a, a new area, a new subspecialty that, um, that has developed. Okay. Excellent. Um, I didn't even know that they existed. That's yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um maybe they want to work on the title though. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so um the next question is uh what what are the long term effects of taking medication on the brain and the chemical balance once you stop them? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um and it's first of all, I think it's 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 a challenging question because um, there are no clear guidelines, uh, especially like in the world of OCD, as to how long someone should stay on these medications. Um, in depression, we do have, I think, we do have more clear guidelines. Um, for instance, if someone has had one episode of depression and hasn't had recurrent depression, there's a guideline that suggests that it's worth staying on a medication for a year and then probably to try and stop after that. Um, whereas for recurrent serious depression, um, that the recommendation is to stay on it um, long term, if not indefinitely. But for OCD and also some, um, some of the anxiety disorders, there really is no consensus. Um, like I've seen anything from uh, one to two years to indefinitely. Um, and I think part of why we don't have guidelines is we don't have reliable information. Uh, I'm not a researcher, but if I were a researcher, I think this is what I'd want to study. Mm. Like, um, and I think I think there's a reason why it doesn't get studied, uh, or maybe several reasons why it doesn't get studied. Um, number one, um, like the pri private sector doesn't want to fund these studies because they don't want to find out what the long-term effects are. I yes. think, or or because um, uh, it's expensive to to run studies that last. 20 or 30 years. Um, and so it's really, I think, an important role for government um, to, to do these studies. And I think another issue is that um, there's an ethical issue in doing the studies because it would involve like a truly rigorous study of this question of how long to stay on medication uh, would involve um, dividing randomly people who are really really suffering with mental illness into two groups, one that's getting treatment and one that isn't, yeah. uh, and then follow, following them. Um, so it's, it's a really challenging area to, to get information about. Um, so, so what do we know? So the, as far as the long-term effects of taking medication on the brain, I would say we know, we know nothing. <laughs> um, it, you know, there, there have been many hypotheses and many theories, uh, but they, they're really, I think, all over the map. Yeah. Um, some, of, some of the hypotheses are that it's actually helpful to stay on medication long-term 
for someone with um, severe depression or severe anxiety because in a way it protects the brain from uh, the damages that that happen um, if someone has high levels of depression or anxiety. But there are others who feel that um, that it might interfere with the, the brain's natural uh, ability to, to heal itself. Um, so we don't really know. Um, as far as, as far as uh, any physical risk in taking medications uh, such as SSRIs long term, and I realize I've mostly been speaking about SSRIs. Um, we, we know that um, if someone is on an SSRI for decades, they have a slightly increased risk for osteoporosis, which is the weakening of the bones, um, which usually happens toward you know, the latter part of life. And we also know that there is some uh, increased risk for, for bleeding. Mm. Uh, and I, I would say it's, it's a very slight increase, but if someone is having to take an SSRI, but also having to take other medications that also uh, might uh, put them at risk for bleeding, that, you know, that can be a factor. Um, but really, um, those are the only things that we know for sure about long-term use of the medication. Okay. No, thank you. And thank you for being so honest. Um, I guess the mind, without sounding cliche, is kind of like space. There's so many, isn't it? There's way more neurons in the brain than there are stars in the various galaxies or something. Um, so for us to try and figure it yeah. all out in this lifetime is, is a, a big leap. Yeah. And I think we're really, we're just at the beginning of, of um, trying to understand uh, everything about the brain and I, I you know I don't know that we'll ever truly understand everything because no. um, yeah it, it, I guess it, it, it makes sense that we can only understand so much um, uh, given yeah given how complex the brain is yeah yeah it's both fascinating and frustrating in equal measure um, yeah okay yeah so um, the next question is, uh, how long should you be symptom-free before uh, trying to reduce meds? So um, I would say, uh, I, and I mentioned this before, unfortunately, we don't have clear guidelines with OCD. Mm. Um, but I would say that it probably makes sense to stay on medication for a minimum of a year. Uh, before trying to reduce meds. And I would say that during that year and continuing beyond that year, being, being in behavioral therapy um, would be, you know, would really be important and helpful. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I was going to say the, the other thing I, I would add to that as well is um, I know some people want to get rid of all intrusive thoughts but the truth is that there's that study that came out that was like 95 percent of the population have intrusive thoughts it's just someone with ocd the thoughts stick around longer and because there's anxiety there they becomes uh, more negatively meaningful um so i guess i just to clarify that for anyone listen sometimes symptom free could just be you're not doing compulsions and anxiety is less but you may never get rid of the, the thoughts I think I'm glad that you're you're pointing this out, and yeah, I think I, I would have actually answered the question differently. That uh, in the world of OCD, people people do not become symptom free. That um, or or maybe very rarely so. Mm -hmm. That what we what we hope for is just not that those intrusive thoughts go away, but that um, they we just um, they don't bother us as much yeah. and, and they just kind of stayed into the background that we notice them, uh, for what they are, but we carry on in our lives and, uh, and we don't let them, you know, change, um, yeah, change our experience of the world or, or the, dis the decisions we make. Um, so, uh, in OCD, 
um, I mentioned that one year, like that it's probably important to stay on the medications for at least one year. Uh, but even at the one year mark, I think it's important to, um, to expect that you will still have some symptoms, but hopefully they would be significantly more manageable and that you will have been able to uh, address address them um, in, in different ways. Um, and that hopefully when medication is stopped, um, that um, one would continue to be able to, to work on the intrusive thoughts uh, through behavioral therapy, or at least through the skills that one learns, uh, one has already learned in behavioral therapy. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. Um, okay, so the next question is very similar, uh, which is um, it would be useful to know um, how to reduce or come off medication uh, and advising when choosing to do this. Uh, and is this is the answer to this kind of probably best to speak to your, your psychiatrist because it's a personal decision or is there anything that's worth them knowing? Yeah, so... Um, for some reason, in psychiatry, um, people often come off the medications um, on their own. They either read about how to do it on the internet or they just wing it. Um, and I think it's it's something unique to psychiatry. You don't you don't often hear about that when it comes to diabetes medication or blood pressure medication. Um, and I don't know what that says about psychiatry or psychiatrists or. Or what, or the experience of of getting treatment um, for mental health, but it is really helpful to work with a psychiatrist when coming off medication, whenever possible, because it can be a process. And um, if one stops cold turkey, most people, I would say, get some measure of withdrawal. Uh, which um, which can be quite uncomfortable. Um, it's quite uncomfortable, and I think it can be, for the most part, uh, avoided as well. So when I work with a patient to come off medication, I usually do it very slowly, uh, usually um, maybe reducing a dose by even as, as little as 25% a month. Um, but everybody's, everybody's different. Like some people actually can stop cold Turkey and they feel pretty much okay. But some people are exquisitely sensitive to any medication drops. Um, and I would say the most challenging drop is going from, is, is the very end, like going from the tiniest dose to nothing, um, can, you know, sometimes really be uncomfortable. Um, and not only is it important to reduce slowly, but there are also uh, a couple of tricks that can sometimes help uh, to, to manage the withdrawal. Um, and while the withdrawal is usually time limited, it, it, can, it can sometimes be quite uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for clarifying. And uh, this this is kind of my question as a follow-up is that the way you said the last 25% to going to zero medication can be sometimes the hardest. D do you feel that that's potentially because the placebo or the idea of the brain's now going, now I've got nothing? So when a thought does come, you maybe you start to worry that you're not on any medication and that just naturally makes the, the, the thoughts worse. I, I do think that that's possible. I think there is um, the opposite of a placebo effect. It's called a nocebo effect mm -hmm. when someone is stopping medication. Um, but yeah, but I do I do know also that the withdrawal is also a real physiological phenomenon, and I think that's been studied. Um, uh, that's been studied um, in the laboratory as well, that it's it's a real thing. Um, but it could be a combination of both, for sure. Yeah, cool. Now, that was just my curiosity getting the better of me. So uh, we, we, the next yeah. one... The next, no, that's a good thought. Yeah, the, uh, the first part um, you've already answered, which is uh, what to know about long-term use of SSRIs. We, we've discussed that. But the second part of the question was, is it okay to take them forever? Huh. I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you know, I, I think I do um, know that some people seem to just do do better taking uh, SSRIs forever. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that that's it's definitely not true for everybody, but but some people do do better uh, just taking this medication uh, indefinitely. Um, that you know it gives them significant benefit, and you know when they're off of the medication uh, beyond the kind of the time limit time limited withdrawal period, they just seem to really struggle. Um, so um, I would say that it's it's probably worth trying to get off medication at a certain point, but um, you know, if if medication really does help long term without any negative um, side effects, that that yeah, sometimes it might be a reasonable choice. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, you're gonna have to help me with the pronunciation here. But the next question is, uh, please talk. Sure. About, please talk about the benefits of clomipramine. Clum Good. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, clomipramine. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we've talked about SSRIs for the most part. So there's a medication that's actually been around for longer than the SSRIs called clomipramine, which is um, I actually don't know how long it's been around because it's been around longer than I've been practicing, but um, it's um, an older antidepressant uh, of the tricyclic family of antidepressants. And it was really, um, I believe, the, the first treatment for medication treatment for OCD that we had. Um, and it's been found to be as, as good as SSRIs. It's been studied um, a lot. It's been studied head to head with SSRIs and found to have a similar response rate. Um, so it, it's, it's not the, it, today it's not the first choice. Um, or maybe even not the second choice. Um, and that's not because it's not effective, but because it tends to have um, significantly greater side effects uh, mm. than SSRIs. So usually if I see someone uh, who is seeking uh, medication treatment for OCD, I usually start with an SSRI. Um, and if there's no benefit from the first SSRI, I usually even try a second and sometimes a third SSRI before, you know, before we start talking about clomipramine. Um, I'm glad that clomipramine exists because it, it is different from the SSRIs. I mean, occasionally people don't tolerate SSRIs and this is a good alternative. And occasionally for whatever reason, people just don't respond as well to SSRIs as they do to clomipramine. Um, so, so yeah, so that's uh, clomipramine. I, I don't prescribe it very often, but I'm glad that it that it's there. Yeah, absolutely. Used to useful to have as an alternative. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So next questions it's kind of a two-part which is uh, what are the promising OCD medication research areas and will there be any medication breakthrough in the next five to ten years I certainly hope so <laughs> um, so yeah so um, it so SSRIs have been around for I guess now over 30 years and they're still kind of what we go to uh, to treat OCD. Um, so um, it's, it's about time that we have something new. And I, I would say we do have uh, newer medications that we use not in place of SSRIs, but as um, add-ons to SSRIs. So if someone has some level of response to SSRIs but are still really symptomatic and really not functioning well, then we might 
add something and common additions to SSRIs are, are many, um, including, you know, for very severe cases, sometimes antipsychotics. Um, but there's, there's a new um, type of medication that we are increasingly trying, which are medications that modulate uh, a neurotransmitter called glutamate. Mm. Um, so SSRIs um, increase serotonin in the brain. Um, and then there's this other class of medications that, uh, that decrease glutamate or change in some way uh, the way glutamate is working in the brain. And so this, I would say, is probably the most active area of medication research in OCD. Um, there are certain medications that already exist and that are used in other, uh, other areas of medicine that modulate glutamate that, um, are, that seem to hold some promise for OCD. And just to give a few examples, uh, for instance, there is an Alzheimer's disease medication called Mimantine, which is a glutamate blocker. It blocks glutamate receptors, and it um, has shown some benefit for OCD. Um, again, I think it's only been studied as an addition to an SSRI, not by itself. I might be wrong about that. Um, and then there's also Rulazole, which is also a glutamate, uh, what's called a glutamate antagonist. Yeah. And that's used in, in ALS. Uh, there's Lamotrigine, which is used in bipolar depression, which is sometimes uh, now being added uh, to an SSRI. And then there's uh, a medication called N-acetylcysteine or NAC, which has become very kind of uh, very popular as um, a possible add-on uh, to help with OCD. Now, do any of these, um, are any of these medications a cure? It, it's not looking like it to me, um, but, you know, if they could if they could help, um, if they could help a little bit, that that would be better than nothing. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully there's something entirely new that um, that um, isn't hasn't been uh, identified yet that will, you know, be more have more of an impact um, in this area. But there is definitely a need for for some new treatment options uh, in OCD. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, no, thank you for going there. I didn't realize there was a lot of those areas, so that was interesting. Um, so kind of last question then is, is there anything else that you'd like to add that I haven't asked you or you think is worth sharing? Um, no, I think, I mean, I think we've really, the questions that were asked by your audience have, have, have been really the questions that I hear from my patients and, I think they've been really good, relevant questions. And I would just want to um, repeat things that I've already said, which is that medications play a, a, a small supportive role, but sometimes, you know, a critical role in treatment of OCD. Um, and that uh, whenever possible, finding a therapist who really knows how to treat OCD, who understands OCD and does um, behavioral therapy and, and can really um, engage, engage um, your audience or whoever needs it in uh, exposure response prevention, that that's really, really key. Um, and that if medication can help that process, then, um, then that, that's really also important and to um, if you've had bad experience, a bad experience with medication once or twice, to not give up and to uh, find someone who you can work with who will hopefully be able to find something that would be more helpful uh, in the future. Brilliant. Yeah, good way to end. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd really like to thank you for your time, David, on behalf of all the listeners. Oh, my pleasure. Um, yeah, it's really, really good to have you on and, and cover this important topic because it's I've done over 120 episodes now and not really touched on medication for 
for various reasons you know I'm not trained I'm not a psychiatrist it's not my place to talk about it so I, I appreciate you coming on to discuss it oh sure I enjoyed it and I would be happy to come on uh, a second time at any point absolutely so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with David. And as I said at the start, disclaimer time, this podcast is not treatment. I am not a medical professional. Uh, all the information on this podcast should be seen as just information and entertainment to help you maybe have a more informed discussion with your psychiatrist. Any steps to do with medication, please seek the treatment of a trained professional and they will be able to speak to you as an individual and advise you appropriately. So until next time, take care.